Darwin's theory of evolution rests on the idea that the incredibly complex web of life today all evolved from simple chemicals and cells. No creator was necessary, just chance and the powers of the fittest forms of life to survive and adapt. But Darwin couldn't see into cells and DNA like scientists of the modern age. He couldn't know these building blocks of life work because of intricate little machines in each cell, so intricate there's no chance they could simply evolve. Darwin couldn't know that DNA functions, life itself functions, because of incredibly complex code, way beyond what even the most brilliant computer programmers have devised. Secular scientists often mock the simple faith of those who believe in an unseen God. But statisticians say the odds are impossible this incredibly intricate, elegant code could ever just evolve. And thus it takes much more faith to believe in such chance than it does to believe an intelligent designer is behind this code at the core of all life. Science philosopher Stephen Meyer in his book Signature in the Cell lays out the evidence for such intelligent design and he refutes the arguments that the theory of intelligent design is just religion and not true science. It's a battle at the very origin and meaning of life that the secular media rarely allow to break out into the open. John Jessup, CBN News. Well, Stephen Meyer joins us now. He's the director of, center of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington. Stephen, it's great to have you here. It's nice uh, to be with it's you, It's a real Gordon. privilege. Yeah. Um, Let's take that question that was in the piece just head on. What do you say to people this, that say, well, intelligent design is just religion in another form? Well, the theory is based on scientific discoveries, discoveries such as the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and chemistry, the discovery of the intricate nanotechnology, the little miniature machines that have been d discovered in cells, rotary engines, sliding clamps, uh, information processing uh, systems. And for me, the most compelling evidence of design is the evidence of design that you find in the digital code that's embedded in the DNA molecule, a four-character digital code that directs the construction of all the machinery that the cell needs to stay alive. So it's, a, it's a, I think, a new day in science. That it's an evidence-based theory, not a theory based on, uh, on religious authority. It may have religious implications, maybe even friendly to religious belief. I think it is myself, but it's based on scientific evidence and even a standard method of scientific reasoning. Well, let's just get your background so we kind of lay some groundwork here. You, you, you're, you have a background in physics, and then you have a doctorate from Cambridge. Right. Uh, I actually started in the field of geophysics. Geophysics. Uh, and uh, my first job was with an oil company. My, my Texan bosses told me my job was to look for all out in the Gulf. <laughs> now they've got a lot of oil well, out in the Gulf. they found a lot yeah. of oil out there, and <laughs> yeah, so. now, now they don't want to find yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Um, what, let's take a look at the critics. And, and one of the critics, I, I, criticisms I hear of intelligent design is it's all trying to get us to think of creation as the earth is 6,000 years old, uh, the dinosaurs and mastodons all, all roam together. It, it, is that part of this or, or no? No, the theory of intelligent design is really not about how, about the age of the earth. It's about the ability to detect the effects of intelligence, uh, the, to detect an intelligent cause and the effects they leave behind. Let me give a simple example. If you go to the Dakotas and you see the faces in Mount Rushmore, mm -hmm. uh, the, the president's faces, you'll immediately recognize that this wasn't a, uh, something that was produced by wind and erosion or some purely natural forces. Instead, there was a, a sculptor or maybe many sculptors involved. Now, inside cells, we don't have little faces, but we have other indicators of intelligence. We have these m little miniature machines we were talking about. And most importantly, we have the, the digital code that's stored in the DNA molecule. Uh, the key discovery came in 1957, four years after Watson and Crick discovered the beautiful double helical sh uh, shape of the DNA molecule. Mm -hmm. uh, Francis Crick uh, had an insight, he it was called the sequence hypothesis, when he realized that there are four chemicals that run down the spine of the DNA molecule, and they function just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters, zeros and ones mm -hmm. in a section of machine code. In fact, Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than any we've ever created. And that's highly suggestive because we know from experience that uh, software programs always come from programmers and that information generally, in whatever form we find it, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a headline, in a newspaper, a paragraph in a book, or information embedded in a radio signal, whenever we find information and we trace it back to its source, 
we always come to an intelligent mind, to uh, uh, not, an, not an undirected immaterial process. It's always intelligence that produces information. What do you do with um, the critique that, I, mean, I think we've all sort of heard this one, that if you take a chimpanzee and a typewriter and give them an infinite amount of time, uh, at some point he's going to come out with a Shakespeare play. Well, that's, play. that's the rub. We don't have an infinite amount of time. The, even... Uh, ex I mean, except the standard age for the origin of the universe, grant 13, 14 billion years, uh, the complexity of a single protein, which is produced by the information on a strand of DNA, so the amount of information required is so improbable, it's so complex, that if every event, and this is a calculation I make in the book, if every event from the origin of the universe till now had been devoted to searching for one of the possible ways of arranging all of the four characters in the DNA molecule or the corresponding amino acids and proteins, you wouldn't have enough time to search but a tiny fraction of all of the, of all of the possible ways of arranging things. Think of the Scrabble letters on a, on a table. You've got to imagine a huge heap of Scrabble letters and you've got to find a, you know, a, a sentence of that length by chance as you, you look through there. there. There's so many possible ways of arranging them. It's like looking for a, a needle in a great big haystack the size of the universe and only having a tiny, tiny amount of time to search. You, your book goes into the statistical analysis and, and give us an idea of the, of the time frame involved, the numbers involved, in terms of statistical probability that this could arise by accident. Well, I, I, sh I show that, again, if Every event, and an event here is defined as just an interaction of elementary particles. You know, er every event that had taken place since the Big Bang had been devoted for, to searching, you know, in a random trial and error way for a single functional gene or protein. There, there wouldn't be enough time to search but one part out of uh, a trillion, trillion possibilities. So the chance hypothesis has really been rejected by leading origin of life scientists. It's just not credible. That's not where the action is. It, it, even people who don't accept design don't think chance is credible. They're looking for other undirected naturalistic processes to try to explain the origin of information. But as I show in the book, those, those other approaches have also failed. And yet we know of a cause which is capable of producing information, and that's intelligence. In fact, that's the only known cause of which we know, and therefore that's why uh, that I argue that it's the best explanation. In fact, just an interesting irony in this is that I actually, in the book, developed the case for intelligent design using Darwin's own method of scientific reasoning. He had a key principle of reasoning, which is that if you're trying to explain something in the remote past, you should invoke a cause or causes which are known to produce the effect you're trying to explain. What are we trying to explain? Information. What do we know from our uniform experience about what produces information? Only one kind of cause, and that's intelligence. So the presence of information in DNA is a, is a decisive indicator of prior intelligent activity. Information points back to intelligence. And the fact that this information changes and can change rapidly uh, indicates that there's, there is a, even active interference. Even, even, even Darwin noted the, the uh, shale deposits in Wales uh, and the Cambrian explosion, that there is a huge explosion of diversity happening within species in a very short geological time. Well, there's two senses of change here. One is the kind of things that we observe, which are mutations, but those types of changes tend to degrade the information, mm -hmm. and, and they don't seem to be an explanation for where it came from in the first place as a result. The other kind of change is the change you see in the history of life when you see these sudden infusions of new biological form, and we now know, just like in the computer world, if you want to give your computer a new function, you have to provide new code. If you have a new organism that performs new kinds of biological functions, you also need code, and that's the big question. Where did all that information come from in the Cambrian explosion, for example, or in these other huge events in the history of life where you have a huge infusion of new forms of life and therefore new information? Where did it come from? The only known cause of information is, again, intelligence. Now that we're applying our intelligence to DNA yes. and are literally changing the code, we just had this huge breakthrough where an assembled piece of DNA was put into a cell and it replicated. What are the implications for that? I'm glad you asked that. There's a lot of confusion about this uh, recent uh, news story about Craig Venter's work. Uh, it's a brilliant technological achievement, but it is not producing, it was not the achievement that it was touted as, as achieving. It's, it's not uh, uh, artificial life. What he did was he took a, a piece of DNA, he copied it, 
and then put the same, DNA con contains information, you put the same information strand back into a cell and the cell was able to read it. It'd be like if you, uh, you wanted to have a, a, a copy of a file on my desktop, I made a file for you, we popped it in your computer and then you said, look, my computer can read it, I've created a computer. Uh, you know, all the important uh, information processing systems and all the other cellular processes were present in that pre-existing bacterium. All that was done was added a gene with some information and it was put into the, the system. It was an artificially copied gene, but it was put into a pre-existing life form. So, the, so he, the, he rearranged it? Well, it essentially, he took a component and copied it and then put it back into an existing, an existing organism. Do you see a time where we could literally uh, design organisms? I don't. I, I, th I think we, ha we really don't understand what life is. It's, it's, DNA is a, an unbelievably complex uh, molecule. It's full of code, and that is a fascinating thing. But DNA alone does not make an organism. We have to have all the, the information processing system that is provided by proteins. We have to have the cell membrane, and it's a functionally integrated system. Each one of these systems depends on the other in a tightly integrated way that engineers would, would, mm -hmm. would, would understand. So we, really, we don't, really don't have a sense of what would be required to design a whole, a whole organism. We know there's a lot of the necessary parts, but getting them all to fit together in the way that they do in an actual organism, it's a very difficult thing to conceive. So we're back to, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> Without a fully formed system, you don't have either one. Well, right. And one of the, uh, on, my, on my website, there's an animation that I think your viewers might, might enjoy. It shows exactly how the digital code in DNA directs the construction of the protein machines and protein parts that the cell needs to stay alive. It's a fascinating process. And some parts of it are very mechanical. It's very much like what goes on at Boeing or Ford, mm -hmm. where engineers will, will design some parts that they want to build. They'll, they'll literally codify that design in digital code. It will be sent down a wire, translated into a machine code, and then that information will be used to direct, if you're trying to build an airplane wing, for example, exactly where the robotic arm places the rivets or something. So we have systems that we've now designed where we use digital information to construct mechanical parts. That's what's going on inside the cell. And it, it, it's an awesome system. And I've got a little, a little piece of animation on my website that, that would, uh, I think, bring that to life where, you know, one picture is worth a thousand words type of thing. Well, what do you say to evolutionists that uh, claim that that whole appearance of design, either the sort of the assembly line construction of a, the processes within a cell or ecosystems, ecosystems that depend, uh, one species is necessarily dependent on another, uh, or even the process of chicken and egg, that all of that, that appearance of design is mere illusion. Well, that's been the standard Darwinian argument since 1859. But what many people don't realize is that Darwin never addressed the question of the origin of the first life. And in 150 years since then, uh, scientists have been unsuccessful in explaining this, the, the origin of the code and the origin of this chicken and egg relationship that you correctly refer to. DNA encodes for proteins but proteins are necessary to read the information on DNA, and it's hard to imagine one without the other. And in my, in, in my book, I look at the different attempts that people have made to try to explain that intricate complexity. The Darwinian idea was that things look designed, but they're not really designed because there's an undirected process, namely natural selection acting on random mutations that can mimic the powers of a designing intelligence. But that explanation is not adequate to explain the origin of the first life for the simple reason that natural selection isn't even a factor until you have life. And I think natural selection also fails to explain some of the higher orders of form and complexity we see in higher animals, not just the first cell. So uh, I think that explanation of apparent design only works if you've got a mechanism that's sufficient to produce all the appearance of design without any guiding hand involved. But I don't, I don't think that's the case scientifically anymore. I think uh, you know, what we're looking at is evidence of real design. Uh, these designer substitute mechanisms have failed to explain the origin of the information you need to build the first life and also the higher orders of form that arise in the history of life. Well, Stephen and I can talk for a long time, but I'm, I've been told i got to wrap. So Signature in the Cell, it's available. It's one of the top-selling science books um, in, in the country today, and I encourage you to get a copy. Get informed. Um, it's available in bookstores, and if you want to go to Stephen's animation, all you have to do is log on to CBN.com, and we'll direct you right over there.